The most important book in the world is the Word of God. Amen? I believe that we are studying one of the most important books in the most important book in the world, and that's the book of Revelation. And tonight we're going to look at one of the most important chapters in one of the most important books of the most important book in the world, and that's Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. This is one of your more difficult chapters. At least it's a more difficult chapter for for a lot of people to understand. I think by the time we get through here, you'll see that it's not that difficult at all. But uh, people that try to... uh, I say, what's the term they use? Um, Figureize. Is that a good term? Figureize everything in Revelation. They have difficulties with this because it's very difficult to do. I believe... When you look at the Word of God, you should. the first thing you should do is take it literal. Amen? Amen. Take it literal. Folks, let me just remark again tonight. This is our rule of faith and practice. It's not what we think about something. It is thus saith the Word of God. Amen? Amen? It is, this is what we live by. This is what we teach. This is what we... Uh, This is what we're going to stand before God with one day. It is the Word of God. I will give an account to God one day the way that I handled this Word, whether or not I lived by it, whether or not I preached its uh, contents, uh, the way that God would want me to preach. You will one day give an account of whether or not you did what the Word of God uh, taught you to do uh, also. Now, what we're looking at is something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, You know, by the way, if this was a hotel, we wouldn't have a 13th chapter. (laughs) They don't have floor number 13 in hotels. Have you ever stayed in floor number 13 in a hotel? You never will. I don't know why, but they don't. But um, we do have a Revelation chapter 13. Thank God for that. Now, do you remember in Revelation chapter 11, we saw God's two witnesses. Now we will see that the devil will try to imitate what God does. And he does that a lot, by the way. He does that a lot. He tries to imitate what God does. And he does a pretty good imitation of God. But we, looking into the Word of God, can determine whether or not it's real or whether or not it is not real. All right, Revelation chapter 13, let's begin with verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea. Who's doing this speaking here? It's John. John the Revelator. John who God revealed this truth to him when he was excluded. uh, Excluded, he was um, on a deserted island, the island of Patmos, and God... Uh, revealed this stuff to him. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Sand, I think, represents unstableness, represents a bad foot. And you remember uh, Jesus compared the, the wise man and the foolish man, that the foolish man built his house upon the sand, you recall the parable, and the wise man built his house upon the solid rock. So sand represents unstableness. Uh, And I think that's what it represents here too, a bad foot. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. The sea represents the nations of the world. The nations of the world. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. I saw a beast. What did John actually see? I think what he actually saw or will see, he actually saw and one day will happen, is the dictator of the revived Roman Empire rising up during the tribulation period out of the world, out of the unstableness of the nations of the world. And this dictator, you best know him by the term the Antichrist. The Antichrist is mentioned uh, several times in the Word of God. I was going to write down a bunch of scriptures, but I didn't see the importance of it. Five major uh, passages of scripture... Two or three places in the book of Daniel he's mentioned. Uh, We're studying him pretty much in detail here, but we will even get more in detail when we get to Revelation chapter 17. The word beast here, I think, is a very interesting word that 
that God uses here. He says, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Beast, to me, represents wild power. Power, great power, but it's wild and it's very unstable. And we'll see a little bit later where the beast gets his power. Now, notice it says, I stood up on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea that represents the Antichrist. The sea represents the nations of the world. Having seven heads, this refers to the seven empires that has or will control Israel during her history. We, we mentioned these last week, if you recall. Uh, Egypt, you remember they went into bondage for Egypt. That was, uh, uh, I guess, the first uh, 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 great empire that controlled Israel. And then Assyria in about 720, 721 B.C. You remember twen- ten tribes of the northern kingdom went into captivity. And by the way, they never did come back out. Assyria... And then you got the Babylonian kingdom or Chaldea. You got uh, the Persia, the Macedonia or the Greece Empire, and then you got Rome uh, for about 500 years thereabout. And then later the revived Roman Empire, which will be headed by the Antichrist. So when it talks about the the beast that will rise up out of the sea, this is the Antichrist having seven heads. I think it talks about the seven. Um, empires uh, that has ruled uh, Israel. And then it says, and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. The ten horns, horns usually represents power uh, when you study it in the ver- uh, Word of God. The ten horns, I think, refers to, to the ten nations of the revived Roman Empire. And, and I know that there's a lot of commentaries that you could look at and it would probably list exactly who these ten nations will be. I'm not able to do that. I don't know when this is going to be. Uh, do you think the United States will be one of these, um, uh, part of this um, ten nation power? I don't know. I don't know if she will be or not. But this represents the the uh, ten nations of the revived Roman Empire. Daniel gets into that quite a bit. Um, it'll start out as ten um, independent nations, but when you get on into the tribulation period, you'll see that it will go into one as a as a one nation, one religion dictatorship. Uh, governed by the Antichrist himself. And it says, And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. What does blasphemy represent? It represents the slander against the Creator of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now look at verse 2. And the beast... This going refers back to the dictator or the Antichrist and the beast which I saw. Now notice what it says. Was like unto, and it's going to tell us what he's like. Now, let me go ahead and insert this right now. <clears throat> this is a real man. He is a real person. Good possibility that this man is living today somewhere. Good possibility that he is living somewhere today. He is a he is a human being. Now a lot of people disagree with me on that, but he is a human being. Just simply a human being. And you'll see later tonight, and when we get into it more so, even more powerful next Sunday night, you will see that he will be under the power of Satan himself. It's a real man. Now notice what he's like unto. Number one, he is like unto a leopard. <clears throat> now a leopard is a fast moving animal. Very fast moving animal. And I think when it says that he's like unto a leopard, that probably represents this, his speed. How fast he will capture the world very quickly. By the way, as soon as the rapture occurs, his job is going to begin, my friend. He's going to come on the scene and the Scripture talks about He will come in with flattery and He's going to convince the world to trust Him. Israel is going to trust Him even. The majority of the world will trust Him. 
He will become the dictator. The dictator of the world. Very quickly he will, he will uh, achieve that role. Then it says, And his feet were as the feet of a bear. I think that refers to his powerfulness that we will look at just a, just a little bit later. He has great power. Next week especially we'll talk about the, the miracles that he will be able to perform. Now listen to me carefully. I don't think no man living today has the power to perform miracles. Don't believe any man has that power. No man whatsoever. I don't care what he claims to do. Don't care what he claims to be. I don't care what his name is. Man today has no power to perform miracles. But that power is going to be restored. Now we've already seen a couple of guys back in Revelation chapter 11 that will have power to perform miracles. Amen. That, that's the two witnesses. And there will be others during the tribulation period. But we'll see here that the Antichrist will have power to perform miracles. Now, I don't know what the devil does. But I do know that God today does not give man the ability to perform miracles. No reason for it. I could go into detail and tell you the reasons for that and the unreasons for that. Um, but man cannot do this. I, listen, I do believe in a divine healer. And his name is Jesus Christ. But I don't believe that power is given to man. You know, I'm always amazed at these people who say that they can do this stuff. Why don't they go down to St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis? Come on now. Listen. If I could perform miracles, I would get out of my office in Florida and I would fly down to Memphis and I'd go to work. Amen? I would go to work. Or wherever else the need might be. But it's, it's not there. Alright, let's move a little bit further. Um, notice it says, and the dragon gave him his power. Now we studied this dragon in Revelation chapter 11. Who did we say the dragon was? That's Satan himself. So who is it that gives the power to the beast or the power to the Roman dictator or the power to the Antichrist? Who is it? It's the dragon. It's Satan. He gives him his power. Listen, this is a real man with great power from the devil himself. The devil himself. That's the reason why the world is going to accept him because of what he can do. And then not only does he give him great power, it next it says, and he gives him his seat. What does that mean? It simply means he gives him his position, where his position is going to be. And he gives him great authority. That means that Satan will give him the power to rule. He, Satan himself will give him the power to have the authority over the world. Now, to know more about this, uh, this dictator, I want us to jump back real quickly to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll come back to Revelation in just a moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, Now we did beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. It's talking about the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. There were some that thought that Jesus had already came back. He said, don't be troubled about that. Verse 3, he says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a fallen away, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. That fallen away, I have studied this extensively, and it simply means departure. Let that, that day is not going to come until there come a, a great departure. And I think I saw about the rapture itself. That day is not going to come until you see that there's going to be great multitudes of people that are going to meet, be missing. Amen. Can you imagine the, when, when the rapture occurs, those who are left behind is going to recognize that there has been a great departure. Amen. 
There's not going to be a baby one left anywhere in the world. Nowhere. Multitudes of husbands and multitudes of wives and mothers and daddies and children all of a sudden are going to be are going to disappear off of the face of the earth. But as Paul speaking to the church at Thessalonica, he said, now listen to me. That day is not going to happen. Talking about the coming of the Lord in chapter, we talk about verse 1, verse 2. Until there first come a departure or falling away first. And then he says, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who is this? This is the one we're speaking about. That's the beast in Revelation chapter 13. That's the Antichrist. So when the rapture occurs, then the man of sin is going to be revealed. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He said, let me tell you what's keeping him from being, keeping this from happening. You know what's going to, what's keeping this to happen. And he says, for the mystery of iniquity do have already worked. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of, of the way. That refers to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is keeping things together. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, that's talking about his end, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, that's talking about at the end of the tribulation period. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, talking about the Antichrist, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. I, I must mention this. Um, verse 10 and verse 11 is, is a, a very serious passage of Scripture. I don't know how you interpret that, but let me tell you how I interpret it. I believe verse 10 and verse 11 tells us that if you're given the opportunity to be saved and you reject Jesus Christ, when the rapture occurs, your destination is already sealed. I believe that's what it says. It says, with all deceitfulness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall, that's talking about during the tribulation period, shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe the Antichrist. These are some of the ones that's going to be receiving the mark of the beast that we will look at next uh, Sunday night. So it talks about the man of sin, the son of perdition is his name. By the way, there's two men in the Bible that, um, that uh, God refers to as the son of perdition. That's the one that we're looking at tonight, the Antichrist. Any of you m remember who the other one was? Judas Iscariot. He's the other one. He's the other one that is mentioned as the, the son of perdition. Just as Satan... Um, empower Judas and influence Judas, he is going to empower this man during the tribulation period. Let me give you a brief contrast between the Antichrist and Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus came from above. The Antichrist will come or ascend from the pit. He will ascend, remember it said, from the seas of the world from the troubled seas of the world. He will come from below, from this earth. But Jesus came from above. Amen? Number two, Jesus came in His Father's name. The Antichrist will come in His own name. Jesus humbled Himself. The Antichrist will exalt Himself. Jesus was despised. The Antichrist will be admired. Jesus will be exalted the Antichrist will be cast down to hell. Jesus came to do His Father's will. The Antichrist will come to do His Father's will. Satan. Jesus came to save. The Antichrist will come to destroy. Jesus is the Good Shepherd. 
The Antichrist is the evil shepherd. Jesus is the true vine. The Antichrist is the vine of the earth. Jesus is the truth. The Antichrist is the lie. Jesus is the holy one. The Antichrist is the lawless one. Jesus is the man of sorrows. The Antichrist is the man of sin. And finally, Jesus is the Son of God. The Antichrist is the son of perdition. Now look at verse 3. John's still speaking, going back to Revelation chapter 13. John's still speaking. And I saw one of his hands as it were wounded to death. This means one of the rulers will be almost destroyed. One of his heads, one of the nations. And his deadly wound was healed. That means it will be revived. And all the world wondered after the beast. Speaking of the Antichrist. They wondered at his so quickly come back. They will begin to follow this wicked man. And then in verse 4 we have a, we see more of a description of the dictator's religious background. It says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. When it says they worship the dragon, what does that mean? They're Satan worshipers. They worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, the Antichrist. And then it says, and they worshipped the beast. So we'll not only see that satanic worship, but we will see the worship of man saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They first worship the devil, and then they will worship the man, who is a representation of the devil. Folks, I think we still see that in our world even today. I know we have satanic worship. I've seen it. And I know we have people that actually worship people. I think we've got folks that even worship uh, false preachers. I think we've got people that worship people that are dead. And that was never intended by, by God. Amen. I think we've got people that worship the, uh, the, the mother of Jesus. And let me tell you something. The mother of Jesus would not want you to worship her. Amen. Amen. She would say to you, if she could speak to you tonight, you need to worship my son. I was just simply a vessel that God chose. I'm special, yeah, because God chose me, but it wasn't because of what I did. You need to worship my son. Don't worship me. And don't pray to me. I can't answer your prayers. You need to pray to Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can answer your prayers. Now look at verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies. This, <laughs> this is talking about how a great speaker, he's going to be a great oil orator. When he speaks and those TV cameras are zoomed down on him, the world, are go the world is going to be impressed as they see him come across that television screen. He's going to be such a great speaker. And people are going to listen to him. And people are going to believe him. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Now, how will people accept the blasphemy of God? I think it'd be very easy. I think it'd be very easy. I think at the very beginning, he's going to lie. I think he'll continue to lie. He will always twist the truth for sure. But then there might be some say, yeah, but God, what, what about... And then he's going to say, let me tell you a little bit about your God. And then he's going to start blaspheming the name of God especially Jesus Christ. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. This is talking about <coughs> the three and a half years that he will continue. Now look at verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Again, he continues his assault against God and his assault against anything that stands for God. Anything that stands for God. 
Remember we talked a couple of three weeks ago that I believe that the temple will be rebuilt. And I think here is a salt against even that temple. Look at verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Next week we will get into more detail when it talks about those that are going to be beheaded uh, if they do not receive the mark of the beast. He will have the authority to make war against the saints of God. And you say, now wait a minute, Pastor. At the rapture, all the saints are going to be raptured out. So who are these saints that are on the earth? These are those that are saved after the tribulation period. I thought you said that you couldn't be saved. No, I said if you reject Christ during the church age, I don't believe that you'd have an opportunity to be saved. But folks, there's multitudes and millions and millions and millions and millions of people that will still be living during the tribulation period that have never rejected Jesus Christ. For whatever the reason may be, maybe they've never heard the word of God. Maybe they've never received the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talked about the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that's going to be preaching all over all over the world, amen? Television and going to all over the different parts of the world. They're going to be leading people to Christ, amen? We talked about the two witnesses that will be television evangelists that will be preaching and people will be saved as a result of that. And when people are saved, if they really do what they're supposed to be doing, then they're going to be leading other people to the Lord, amen? And their neighbors and their friends and people that they work with. So yes, there's going to be a lot of people saved during the tribulation period. A lot of people saved during the tribulation period. And this is the saints that he will be making war against. And again, next week we will look at that. It's a very terrible war. And to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, where did the Scripture say he gets this power from? From the dragon. Now, who is the dragon? The devil himself. Look at verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now, if we stopped right there, that would say all that dwell upon the earth worship him. But there's more to the Scripture. Notice what it says. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Who are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life? It's those that are saved. Those that are saved. Why is it referred to as the Lamb's book of life? Because Jesus stood as a lamb, an innocent lamb, slain. When it talks about slain from the foundation of the world, it simply means that he stood as a lamb slain even before the world was created. Folks, nothing takes God by surprise. God already knew before he ever created mankind that mankind would fall. Now, don't don't get confused with this. God did not plan the fall. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because there is the fall was the result of sin. And there is no sin with God. God did not plan the fall. But because of his ability to see everything Everything in the future, he knew what would happen. He knew what would happen. He knew that you would be saved, or he knew that you would not be saved. You say, now this really gets kind of crazy here. What is it that God does not know? God knows it all. God knows everything. Does that mean that God predestined my destination? No, you're saved as a result of your choice. You made a choice. He just knew what you would do. Your eternal life is predestined because you put your trust in Jesus Christ. 
because of God's foreknowledge. This is what predestination simply means, and I've shared this with you dozens of times. But because of God's foreknowledge, He foreordained that Jesus Christ would come and die for all mankind. And He predestined the believer to have everlasting life. I don't see anything complicated about that at all. Just as simple as it can be. Very, very simple. That, when it talks about the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that's what it talks about. Verse 9, If any man have an ear, let him hear. Did you notice anything different about verse 9? Then when this term was used seven times in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, seven different times God made this statement. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Now in Revelation chapter 9, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear. But in Revelation chapter 2, in Revelation chapter 3, seven different times there was something added to that. Any of you know what it was? To the church. Let's go over it real quickly. Let me just pick out one. Just pick out one. It says, um, hmm, verse 7, Revelation 2 and 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Seven different times you go through that. I looked at it very quickly this, this afternoon. The church at Ephesus, Myrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, every one of these churches, it says that. Now, why is it over in Revelation chapter 13? God leaves that out. Because the church isn't here, is it? Amen? Uh, now, that gets me excited. We're not going to be here. We're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. What a time, wonderful time that is going to be. Amen? Now, look at verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. God's a fair judge. And what that phrase says there, that God will always make the judgment fit the crime. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. We know what's going to happen to the Antichrist at the end. Amen? Amen? and the false prophet, and the beast. We know what's going to happen to them. Then it says, He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Now this does not mean that we should never go out and fight. I think there's times when we should fight. I think God has given authority to nations to, to defend themselves. Amen? The United States defends herself on many different times. Many different occasions. So the, the, the peace lovers, many times they take this particular scripture and say, see there, we are not supposed to go out and fight. But then we find in the Word of God, listen, you go into the Old Testament, you see a lot of battles. God was the general. God was the one that was over uh, the armies. When it says, he that killeth with a sword should be killed with a sword, I think it's a promotion of capital punishment. It shows that uh, God does authorize capital punishment uh, through government. And then it says, <coughs> Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now look at verse 11. Now we're going to be introduced to a second dictator. We've already looked at the first. Now let's look at the second. And behold another. Now that word another there is a very interesting word. It doesn't mean another of a different kind, but it means another of the same kind. It says, Behold another, another of the same kind, another beast cometh up out of the earth. Now, when we looked at the first beast, going back to verse... Um, one, and I, 
It says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now we see this beast rise up out of the earth. Is that significant? Yes, it is. Very much so. The first beast is a political leader. He rises up out of the, the world. But the second beast is a religious leader, and he rises up out of the earth. The word earth there is actually means the land. I think it has reference to the land of Palestine. I think it has reference that this beast, which is a man, will be a Jew. And he will be the religious leader. The other one was the political leader. Now, they will join forces. They will work together, which we will see here in just a moment. It says, and I, and I beheld another, another of the same kind, beast coming up out of the earth, or out of the land, is actually what it has reference to. And he had two horns like a lamb. He imitates Christ. The first beast opposed Christ. That's the Antichrist. The second beast imitates Christ. It, to, to me, it's kind of amazing. It takes two men to try to fulfill Christ. But even two men can't do it, can they? They try, but they can't. They're unable to fulfill the position of Jesus Christ. And then, then it says, And he spake as a dragon. You remember what the dragon represented earlier in the chapter? It represents Satan. So he speaks the words of the devil. He speaks what the devil wants him to say. He's under the direct influence of the devil. Now look at verse 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that which dwell therein to worship the first beast. See, he's the, the first beast was the political leader. The second beast is the religious leader. And he's going to cause the all of the world. It says all of the world, it says, all that dwell therein to worship the first beast. He forces, he's going to, we'll see in just a moment that he's going to force people to actually bow down to the image of the first beast. It says he, uh, he calls all that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This is talking about the revived or the revision of the Roman Empire. Now notice verse 13, how he operates. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This is going to be a great miracle worker. A great miracle worker. He will have the power of Satan, demon power. The demon world, my friend, is always connected to the devil. Always. He is going to have great power. Listen, the devil has the ability to perform miracles. I think he gives power to his preachers to be able to perform miracles. Many of them. Things that you hear about today, they are either of fake or they are of the power of the devil. But the power is going to be even increased during the tribulation period. Another thing that I think that is interesting here where it says, And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. He plays with the fire. But one day he'll be cast into the fire himself. You remember when you was a kid, your mom and daddy told you, don't play with the fire, it's going to hurt you. He's going to get in trouble from playing in the fire. Because one day he'll be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20. 
Now look at verse 14. Verse 13 says, He does great wonders so that He make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Again, I think all this will be televised. We talked about that in our last study. I think there will be TV cameras that will be televised in this all over the world for the entire world to see. Verse 14, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which He hath power to do in the sight of the beast. Don't ever think that the devil cannot do great things, marvelous things, mir- miraculous things, because he can. You, you remember, any of you that studied um, the purpose of miracles, uh, I loved studying that when I was in the seminary, and the purpose of miracles, there was always a purpose for miracles, and miracles was not for the purpose of just healing people or causing the blind to see or the, 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 the deaf to hear or the dumb to speak. Miracles served a purpose, and it was for the purpose to prove that those who performed them was from God. That was the purpose of miracles. Matter of fact, there was miracles performed on people that were not even saved. They had no faith at all. You know, today they say, you, you go to some of these healing campaigns and, and you go down there if you need to be healed. And if you're not healed, they will say, well, you just don't have enough faith. God doesn't need faith. God doesn't need your faith to heal you. Amen. But the purpose of miracles, it was their credentials. It was to prove who they were. So we see the devil here imitating the work of God. And what he is doing when he performs these miracles, he's doing it in deception. He's imitating Jesus Christ. And the world is going to fall for it. Not all of them. But much of the world will fall for it. Now look at verse 15. Well, let me read a little bit in verse 14. Um, Saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, that's the first beast that we looked at in our last study, which had the wound by a sword and did live. He's demanded that the people of the earth make an image of the first beast. Again, now, when we we think about this beast, we think of a... I'm not sure what we visualize in in our mind, but it's a man. It is a man. It is a human being that is born of a woman that Satan uh, possesses. But it is a man. You say, well, could he fall against this? Sure he can. But he chooses not to do so. And there will be an image made of this man. What's the purpose of the image? to bow down and worship the image. I personally think this, and and I could be wrong. Um, I think these images are going to be uh, produced, uh, mass produced. And I think they're going to be sold all over the world. What, What do they do today? Do they not make images today and sell them all over the world for people to pray down to and pray up to and bow down to? And I think this may be possibly one of the things that will happen. They may make a big image, but then they're going to make smaller images in mass production. At least that's just my opinion anyway. (coughs) Now look at verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. This is the main image. Look what it says. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast, notice this, should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, folk, if, let me tell you something. That's great power. That is great power. Now, wherever this image is going to be, I would suppose it's going to be in Jerusalem. I bet you there will be scientists that will come from all over the world and they will come and they will inspect this image. And, they will, and this image will have the power to speak. And they're going to inspect this image and try to determine how in the world can this be done. 
And the conclusion will be, it's a miracle. It is a miracle that this image, image should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now this is something that will cause the entire world to turn and worship the beast with the exception of those few that will refuse to do so, they are the ones that will accept Jesus as their Savior. Verse 16, And He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, are in their foreheads. So he's going to cause everyone to get a mark. This is the mark of the beast. And the mark, the scripture says that the mark will be either on their right hand or in their foreheads. The word mark there is a Greek word that means to scratch or to etch or to stamp. It's a badge, badge of identification. And with this, well, notice, let me just go ahead and read a little bit further. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You've heard about this all your life. It's going to come to pass. Technology's already here, folks. It's been here for years. I don't know what the mark will be. I'm not sure how it's going to appear. But I know one thing. They've got scanning devices now that can scan and tell them anything that they want to know. Anything that they want to know. The technology is here. You know, we know more about this today than folks knew a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, probably people were trying to figure out, I wonder how all this is going to be. How will this come to pass? Folk, that's why I say that I don't think we're in a we're a long way from this occurring. I don't think it's too far off. Everything is in place. Everything is in place. Now, those that refuse to receive this mark, they're not going to be able to go to the grocery stores. They're not going to be able to buy. They're not going to be able to sell. They're not. I bet there'll be probably roadblocks that will be set up, and as you go to these roadblocks, they're going to check to see if you've got the mark. And if you don't have the mark, some terrible things are going to happen to you as we look a little bit later. There'll be people that will be beheaded because they refuse to bow down to the image of the beast. They refuse to receive the mark of the beast. There will be people that will die of starvation. Can you imagine a dad trying to figure out how in the world to take care of his family? And he becomes a Christian. And he realizes that he can't buy food, can't buy utilities, can't sell anything to buy anything. Probably won't even be able to work. They'll probably fix it to where you will not even um, be able to work. Uh, the United States is going to create something like this before too long. Uh, they're already talking about creating a uh, identification card for the uh, um, people that come into the country that are not citizens. Just one more step. One more step. Folks, it's going to be a terrible time. A terrible, terrible time. Now notice what it says in, in our last verse. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is 
six. See, the number six is the number of man. It's one short of the number seven, which represents perfection. The number of man, six, six, six. The mark of the beast is six, six, six. Now, I thank God that I will not be here. Folk, this is not a fairy tale. This is something that is most definitely going to happen. I remember back when our churches was more evangelistic than, than what many of them are today. We used to show films. Any of you ever watched the um, Thief in the Night? It was a a show that was out many, many, many years ago. As a matter of fact, there was two other, two or three other shows that followed that. Personally, I thought they was great shows. Great shows. I remember the first time I watched it, though. It really made me nervous. But then I thought, why am I nervous? I will be raptured out before all of this happens. Now you remember I told you at the very beginning when we started studying the book of Revelation. We're not studying this just for information. I've heard even, I, I, not here, but I've heard people say, well, why, why study Revelation? You know, we won't even be here when all that stuff happens. Well, it's there for a reason. God permitted John to see it and then write it down and distribute it among all the churches of Asia. Asia Manor. And from there, it's been distributed throughout the last 2,000 years. So there's a reason. Why do you suppose God wanted us to have this information since we're not going to be here? Well, I think it's good for us to know what's going to happen. It gets a little bit better when we get on over to chapter 21, chapter 22 anyway. But I think it's information to help us to understand what we need to be doing is save people in preparing people that are not giving warnings to those who have never put their trust in Jesus Christ. Folk, when the rapture occurs, it's going to be the greatest thing that has ever happened in the history of the Lord's New Testament churches. The greatest thing but it's also going to be the worst event, the beginning of the worst event that will ever happen on this planet Earth. What a day that will be when we meet our Savior face to face. When the rapture occurs, I mean in the moment and the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be out of here. The rapture is going to be a great separator. And what I mean by that, there will be families separated from families. Wives from husbands, husbands from wives, parents from children. What a, what an event. Can you imagine the news headlines the next morning after the rapture? Can you imagine the headlines that will be recorded and People trying to figure out what in the world has happened. Not a baby left in the world anywhere. It's all the babies raptured out because they're covered by the blood. Amen? Amen? Covered by the blood. People on an airplane and the pilot saved. Co-pilot saved. <laughs> Stewart just don't know how to fly the thing. What an event. What an event. Can you imagine Houston traffic about 5.15 in the afternoon if the rapture occurs? <laughs> Boy, my word, what an event. But the Bible says we are saved from the wrath to come. You and me. We who are saved. My dear friend, if you know someone that's not, do what you can to get this message to them.
it is going to happen. Personally, I think I, I pray that it happens during my lifetime. Um, I, I'd rather to go the hole in the sky than the hole in the ground. Amen. You know, I went by and looked at that new funeral home the other day down on Fairmont. It's really nice. I just hope I don't use it. <laughs> you know, it's really nice, beautiful place. But I'd rather go the sky round than the ground round. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Either way, either way. But I'd rather just me and Linda and our, my family, my church family, just go together. Finally, I say this. If the rapture occurred right now, right this moment, all of the saved in this sanctuary is going to vanish, disappear. Are you going with us? Can you imagine all of a sudden I saw a thing. I wish I had thought about it. I would have... Uh, brought it over and showed it to you right now. This would have been real good. It was a church that did this thing. And this preacher was preaching about the rapture. And then all of a sudden, boom, his Bible fell to the ground, to the floor. All the people, with the exception of about eight or ten, was missing. People turned around. They looked around. The What in the world has happened? And all of a sudden, this old boy, he says, I know what happened. He fell on his knees before God. But it was too late. It was too late. Once it happens, it is too late. Stand with me as we pray together and prepare for invitation. Father, dear Lord, we thank You for the information that You give to us in Your Word. Apply it to our hearts. Help us, Father, to take it inwardly so that we can give it outwardly to others that we come in contact with. We thank You, Father, <coughs> for our salvation. Father, I pray for anyone in this service tonight that may not know Jesus. Please, dear Lord, help them to understand their true condition. And Lord, the rest of us, Please touch our hearts. Lay somebody on our heart that we need to share this message with this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.